Thanks for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work on uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, this work was led mainly by Cara Giovanetti, who is a senior graduate student in the audience here from NYU. Uh, she did most of the heavy lifting, so if you have detailed questions, please go ahead and talk to her. Um, as well as Mary Angela Lesanti, Sid Misha Sharma, the previous speaker, and uh, Josh Ruderman from NYU. Um, and hopefully these papers will come out soon. I put a little zero here, so hopefully that works out. Um, all right, so what's the punchline? Um, the punchline is that we have written a code where uh, you can do accurate BBN calculation, which is something that people can already do. But the most important thing is that we can do it quickly. Um, and because we can do it quickly, we can get um, something like this, where we can do calculations of all of the various uh, abundances of these elements and do it really quickly. Um, and we can, um, based on this, we can elevate um, any kind of analysis involving BBN, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, to be on the same level as what you have come to expect from a cosmic microwave background analysis, where you can do very sophisticated uh, Bayesian statistical techniques to infer various parameters, add new physics, and so on. You can now do the same thing with BBN with our code, uh, which we think is where it should be. So that's the punchline. Um, because this is a half an hour talk, uh, I don't have much time to tell you about BBN, although it's extremely interesting. Um, but I'll just tell you briefly how, uh, what BBN is and how it happens. So in the early universe, you have uh, very high temperatures, and you start off with you know, temperatures that are as high as you know, uh, MeV or so on. And so you have all these uh, uh, particles, neutrons and protons, colliding with each other and interacting with each other. Um, and this results in all kinds of nuclear reactions that occur in the early universe. But then the universe, of course, is expanding. And so um, as, as time passes, the universe cools down. Um, and at some point, all of these nuclear reactions uh, will turn off. Um, and uh, when that happens, you end up with some final abundance um, of some of these light elements, uh, such as uh, deuterium, D, uh, helium-3, helium-4, lithium-7, and so on. Um, and the final abundance that you see here is what we call the primordial abundance. Um, and the hope is that by uh, making a measurement of these uh, primordial abundances, you would be able to learn something about what was happening uh, in the early universe. So really, really early. So if you look at the time axis here, we're talking about something like 10 to 100 seconds um, after the Big Bang, or temperatures up to about uh, an MeV or so. OK, so these kinds of abundances, if you can measure them, they're going to be very sensitive to physics that's happening at the MeV scale. Uh, and the focus that we are going to, you know, most of the focus, at least so far, on BBN has been looking at uh, the deuterium abundance and the helium-4 abundance. So you might see some of these symbols here. I'll just define them quickly. Uh, D over H is essentially the number density of deuterium to all uh, protons, uh, free protons. Um, and helium-4, uh, we usually talk about uh, this uh, symbol here, YP, which is uh, just for historical reasons, uh, we're going to use the uh, energy density uh, of helium-4 divided by the total energy density of baryons, and that's called YP. OK, so how do we measure these things? Uh, so I, I'm not really an expert here, but I can tell you what we want to do is we want to look for systems that are very, very old. And the way that we know that they're very old is when they have very low metallicities. Uh, so they don't have very heavy elements um, in them. So for example, we could look for, um, uh, we could look for a column of gas in front of a quasar uh, uh, with very low metallicities. And using spectroscopic data, we, we'd be able to infer uh, how much uh, deuterium you have compared to hydrogen. Um, another thing you could do for helium-4 is to look for very metal-poor galaxies, uh, measure the, uh, again, from spectroscopic data, measure the amount of helium-4 uh, helium in them, and then kind of extrapolate down to zero metallicity, and that gives you what the uh, primordial abundance is. Um, and uh, the kind of, like, you know, in order to test cosmology at MeV scales, you need to measure these very precisely, and we have achieved this for deuterium and helium-4. Uh, lithium-7 is a very interesting story. We can talk about this uh, if anyone's interested. Um, but the point is that uh, currently, if you look at the current measurements that we have of D over H um, and YP, uh, we're sort of at the 1% uh, level uh, for D over H and YP as well. Um, and so if we, can, um, uh, if we can control things on the theory side, um, then we would have a very powerful test of cosmology, potentially something you know, on the percent level, um, which is what we have come to expect for CMB, for example. OK, so this is on the experimental side. I don't have much more to say about that, but now let me tell you about the theory uncertainties um, and what goes into making a theoretical prediction. Um, so the goal is really to make this curve, which is to start off with some initial abundance of neutrons and protons, 
figure out how they evolve, take all the nuclear reactions and, and work them out, and then determine what the final abundance is at the end. So what goes into these calculations? Well, the first thing that you need to know is because at very high temperatures, you're essentially only a bunch of neutrons and protons. So the thing that you need to know is how these things convert uh, between, between the two things. Um, and so you need to know a lot about uh, electroweak interactions and so on. Um, and fortunately, we do know these things pretty well, and so um, that's a relatively small source of error. Um, another thing that you do need to know as well is because the neutron itself is unstable. Uh, it has a lifetime of about, um, I think, about 900 seconds. Um, so as they're interacting, they're also decaying, and you need to know um, how quickly they decay, because when they get lost into protons, that changes what the final abundance is going to be. Um, and so one input into this is the neutron decay lifetime. Um, and again, not, not a super significant source of error here. Um, of course, uh, the most important thing is, you know, after you have a bunch of neutrons and protons floating around, eventually they coalesce, and um, there are all kinds of nuclear reactions that take you up from neutrons to protons and then to higher and higher, um, um, you know, heavier and heavier elements, such as deuterium, tritium, helium, and so on. Um, and between each of these particles, there is a reaction network that takes you from one to the other. And so you need to know these nuclear reaction rates very well. Um, and the way that we do it is we have, we have a whole collection of experimental um, results where people have measured the cross-sections um, of many of these reactions as a function of energy. Um, and so we take that and we turn that into uh, nuclear reaction rates. Um, and this is the main source of error um, when we're talking about uh, Big Bang nuclear synthesis. All right, so these three things, and then the last thing is, is the cosmology. Um, and for standard cosmology, the main thing that really matters uh, is the baryon abundance, uh, which here I'll denote omega bh squared. Um, and the reason, of course, is, you know, if the baryon abundance changes, then all of these reactions, how fast these reactions are happening will change because you have uh, a higher number density uh, of baryons. And so that's the last input. Um, and we take all of these things and we construct a bunch of differential equations that say, you know, the rate of change of deuterium is equal to some rates that depend on the temperature and, and the baryon number density. And then we solve these differential equations uh, to get this curve here. All right? Uh, so that's the basic picture. Um, and of course, um, yeah, so before I go on to, to new physics, uh, I just want to say that, you know, uh, uh, because of the fact that it's very sensitive to omega bh squared, we get a, a determination of omega bh squared at very early times. Um, and if you look at the current state of the uncertainties that we have here, uh, we're, kind of, we're kind of approaching a point where we can make a theoretical prediction that has comparable uncertainty to what you expect from Planck CMB, so roughly 1% uh, or so. Uh, depending on who you ask, but I'll go into more details later. Um, and so this is a, this is a great independent test uh, or an independent way of obtaining something like omega BH squared. Um, I think from the BBN perspective, maybe the more interesting thing is to test uh, new physics, which might be happening uh, at an MEV scale. Um, and one of the most straightforward extensions uh, to the lambda CDM cosmology model is the uh, delta N effective uh, uh, extension. Um, and the typical idea of N effective is that, you know, you're trying to measure how many relativistic degrees of freedom you have uh, other than photons. Um, and in the standard picture, that should just be neutrinos, and that ends up being 3.045 or so. So that's three neutrinos plus a little bit of uh, effects due to the fact that neutrinos don't uh, decouple um, uh, ideally. Um, and so you could also imagine adding an extra energy density that we call delta N effective. Um, and this, you know, you could imagine in, in the very simple picture that we're looking at in this talk, uh, it's just going to be some relativistic uh, degree of freedom that doesn't do anything. It just kind of sits there and redshifts uh, like, um, like uh, radiation. And if you do that, then that alters the relationship between uh, the photon temperature and time. And so that shifts these curves around because the relationship, uh, you know, that I'm showing here at the top, which is the temperature and the time, is going to shift a little bit, and that changes everything. Um, and if you ask, you know, how, how sensitive are we to additional uh, extra energy density, uh, uh, you know, additional uh, degrees of freedom on top of neutrinos, it turns out that we're currently quite comparable uh, to where CMB is currently, although this will change uh, when we go into the future. And that's sort of a, at a 10% uh, measurement. Uh, more importantly, though, is that BBN probes are very different uh, epoch compared to the CMB, because the CMB is very sensitive to what's happening during recombination, which is when uh, the temperature of the universe was something like an EV. But BBN is sensitive to things happening at an MEV. Um, and you could imagine all kinds of things happening between an MEV to an EV that changes the picture 
um, between what you should see at BBN and CMB. So this is something that you should keep in mind as well. It's, it's really an independent probe, and even though CMB is really going to improve, uh, BBN is still going to tell you something uh, different. Okay, so this is the one test of beyond the standard, uh, beyond Lambda CDM cosmology that I'll talk about in this, um, in this talk. All right. So how do we do um, parameter inference? So for example, if I go back to the previous case, I told you uh, we can measure omega BH squared, uh, we are sensitive to delta N effective. How do we actually use BBN data to infer um, these two quantities? And I'm going to tell you what the ideal situation should be. Um, and this is what I call a principal parameter estimation. Um, and so the way that you should do it is you should have, well, okay, I have two parameters of interest, but then at the same time, there are all kinds of other parameters. There are nuisance parameters um, with, with uncertainties that should enter your parameter inference, right? So for example, you don't quite know what the, neut the neutron decay lifetime is. There's some uncertainty, and that should affect uh, your prediction. You should get some error bars, right? Um, and so what we should do is we should construct, you know, some kind of likelihood function that takes all of these things and matches it to observation, um, and we construct a likelihood, um, you know, that, that's a simple, you know, Gaussian likelihood, um, as you can see above, that compares the predicted to the observable, uh, the, the, the observed measurements of yp and d over h, and then just takes into account the fact that there are observational um, uncertainties. Then we should do one of two things. Either we do a frequentist test where we construct uh, a test statistic. I won't go into much detail here, but we, we essentially, you know, try to look for the maximum likelihood uh, in, in all of our parameter space, including the fact that there are nuisance parameters. Uh, or we do something Bayesian, right, where we say, okay, we want to know what the probability of uh, these model parameters are given some, some observed, um, you know, yp and d over h. Um, and what we need to do is we need to um, try to reconstruct what this posterior is, and we usually do this using um, MCMC methods or Bayesian methods, such as nested sampling and so on. Um, and this requires us to, to evaluate this likelihood uh, many, many times over some 14-dimensional space after we include uh, all of the nuisance parameters uh, that, that enter into BBN. So, for example, you need to include the fact that you don't really know the neutron decay lifetime very well. It's at least 14 parameters. You could do, it, it depends, depends on what you want to do, but um, the minimum thing that you need is 14 parameters. So you need to explore some 14-dimensional space, um, and typically, in order to do this efficiently, you need things, you need to be able to evaluate your likelihood, or in other words, you need to be able to, to uh, solve those differential equations that I talked about um, at sort of one second uh, per choice uh, of these parameters in order to do this uh, efficiently. Um, so if we look at, um, also you can also take the BBN uh, stuff that I've, I've told you about, and you can combine this with the CMB, right? Um, and the CMB, you know, takes all of these parameters where you have all, all your lambda CDM cosmology parameters, um, you have some uh, uh, nuisance parameters as well, and they solve it using a Boltzmann solver such as CAM or CLASS. Um, and then they compare it with the Planck measurements, and you can put this together at BBN, and the reason why you should do this is because, like I said, there's comparable power uh, for BBN and CMB for, uh, you know, determining what omega BH squared is and determining what delta N effective is. So it's a, it's, the combination is very important. Um, so one thing you will notice is that in order to combine these two things, right, um, the CMB, in order to evaluate the CLs in the CMB, one thing that you do need to know is what the value of YP is. And that actually comes from uh, predictions from BBN. So the really consistent way to do it is that, you know, once you choose some sets of parameters, uh, you have to first make a prediction from BBN for what the YP value is. Then you put that into the CMB solver, and then you solve it. Um, and then you combine the two likelihoods together, and you do either a frequentist or, or a Bayesian analysis again. So this, again, is uh, the ideal way to do the parameter estimation uh, for a joint BBN and CMB combination. Um, and if you want to do this, then you do, if you have any experience with CMB uh, uh, inference at all, you know that these CMB codes uh, are really pretty fast, right? They're, they're at the one second per evaluation kind of level. So either, you know, all these like class or CAM uh, combined with Planck likelihoods, um, whatever you do on the BBN side, you don't want it to be much, take much longer um, than what class and CAM can already do, because otherwise that really slows your analysis down. And in many cases, you know, if you have done some of these analyses, uh, they're already pretty slow. Um, and, and, you know, you don't want to slow it down even more. So if you look at what existing BBN codes can do, um, I'm only going to talk about open source BBN codes, so things that everyone can use. Um, there are essentially four on the market. Um, there's AlterBBN, which is a C-based code. 
Um, and uh, for various reasons, you know, it's, it's very good for solving new physics very quickly, uh, but it doesn't have the same precision as many of the other codes that are available. Um, and then there are things like Premart and Parthenopy, which kind of takes two different approaches to how to do this calculation. Premart does everything extremely accurately in Mathematica, um, but in the end, when you, when you, ask, when you ask it to solve, um, uh, you know, uh, solve for the uh, BBN evaluation, it takes something like, you know, order a few minutes. Uh, Parthenopy does things very quickly, but it's very difficult to, to, to hack. Um, also, it's written in Fortran, which doesn't really help. Um, and then a more recent implementation is Primordial, which is an excellent code. Uh, it's very good for new, it's written with new physics in mind, so it's really good for, for hacking. Um, you can try to do full parameter uh, estimation, uh, but unfortunately, the runtime is still on the order of 10 seconds, which is, which is still not quite what we need. Um, and so, you know, for a lot of the analyses that are out there, whenever you, whenever you see a BBN-CMB joint analysis, or even a BBN-only analysis, you should keep in mind that they all have to make compromises when it comes to parameter estimation. So the ideal situations that I showed you earlier, they're not exactly doing that. They have to make some kind of uh, approximation to get there. And then if they're combining the CMB, uh, you, you get even more severe uh, uh, approximations that are going on. It's not that these results are necessarily incorrect, but it's just that now, you know, with the, with the new code that we're going to show you, which is called LINCS, uh, which stands for Light Isotope Nucleosynthesis with JAX, um, we can actually do these calculations uh, really quickly. And so you can do the full parameter estimation that I showed you, um, you know, um, just uh, very quickly. And so you don't actually have to compromise on anything. So here I'm showing you 50 different evaluations of Big Bang nucleosynthesis as I uh, alter the baryon to photon ratio, which is the same thing as altering the baryon abundance. Um, and you can see here there are 50 evaluations. I can do this um, in about 12 seconds after one initial round of compilation. Um, and that, um, you know, it's actually much faster than the, the code takes to make this plot. Um, and so now we have a Python-based code uh, that uses this thing called JAX, uh, which allows you to compile code, uh, run it many, many times very quickly, uh, if you need to vectorize things, it's also very easy to vectorize based on uh, the, the uh, framework that's given to you in JAX. Um, it's also differentiable, which I'll say um, one or two words about uh, right at the end of the, the talk. Okay. So this allows us to run something like uh, one evaluation every order 0.1 seconds. And this allows us to run uh, MCNC methods with BBN and combine things um, with CMB. And so since I have not much time left, I will show you some interesting preliminary results, um, but not all of them, and we can discuss more in detail um, uh, offline. Uh, but first thing to do is that, you know, we should compare with very uh, accurate uh, uh, calculations of, BB, of the BBN process just to check that everything is okay. And so this just shows you that we have excellent agreement with Primart when we use the same settings and so on. Um, uh, more like, you know, something like less than 0.1% difference, which is, which is much smaller than um, current experimental and theoretical uncertainties. Um, and then the kinds of analyses that we can do is we can, you know, try to infer what omega bh squared is alone, and these are the data points here shown in squares. Uh, or we can do a joint omega bh squared and effective uh, uh, inference, which are these points shown in, in the circles. Um, and these are the values that you get for omega bh squared if you use just the CMB data, um, just the BBN only data and the CMB data. And I, I might have alluded to this, but there are different ways in which people have compiled nuclear rates uh, into a set of nuclear rates that allow you to, to solve for the BBN uh, final abundance. Um, and these rates don't exactly agree with each other, and so there are rates that are done by Primat and another set of rates that are done by Parthenopy, and you can see that they get slightly different results. Um, and some of them don't, like for example, the Primat rates don't really agree with the CMB rates, but the Parthenopy ones do. And so it's very important um, when we do these analyses to be able to switch between rates uh, as well and to, and to change out rates because um, the fact that we don't really have good agreement means that uh, we need to study these things uh, very, very carefully. All right, so I will skip to the part where we do a joint uh, BBN and CMB result of uh, uh, omega BH squared and N effective together. Um, and these are, uh, uh, I've already shown you this slide. Um, and this is the kind of MCMCs that we have to do where we are varying over many, many parameters. Um, and in the full case where we include all of the full Planck nuisance parameters and so on, that's like 41 parameters that we have to, to uh, 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 vary over. And so this is a very challenging MCMC analysis. In fact, this is not the full triangle plot that I'm showing you here because the full one is really difficult to look at. Um, 
But anyway, the punchline is that we can do this at the same with the same rigor as the CMB analysis. Uh, like I said, important for the one percent precision that we already have. Um, and these are the kinds of results where we have um, uh, blue shows the CMB only. Uh, sorry, the BBN only results. The black dash line is CMB, and the joint uh, is in orange. And you can see that the joint really helps because, like I said, they're comparable in uncertainties. Um, and like I said, you know, there are differences between the parthenopy rates and the premart rates, and the premart rates don't quite agree with the CMB rates, and that pushes things uh, in a different direction, and so on. So these, I think, are the first sort of, you know, uh, quite rigorous ways of uh, inferring these parameters, um, and we can learn a lot more from our kinds of, the kind of analysis that we're able to do now. The last thing I'll say is that the code is differentiable, which means that you get derivatives for free when you run, when you evaluate any functions. And this is really good for um, um, uh, up and coming uh, MCMC techniques that people are really interested in these days. I can talk more about it um, later on, but for now I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs>